We'll take our lesson this evening from the letters of St. Jude and St. James. St. Jude, but you, my beloved, building yourselves upon you, most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto life everlasting. And some indeed reprove, being judged, but others save, pulling them out of the fire. And on others have mercy in fear, hating also the spotted garment which is carnal. Now to him who is able to preserve you without sin and to present you spotless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory and magnificence, empire and power before all ages and now and for all ages of ages. Amen. And from St. James, my brethren, if any of you err from the truth and one convert him, he must know that he who causeth a sinner to be converted from the error of his way shall save his soul from death and shall cover a multitude of sins. Thank you, St. Jude and St. James. In the 19th century, France, as the saintly priest Jean-Marie Vianney drew near to his new assignment in Ars, he lost his way because of the heavy mist covering the landscape. Finding a young lad by the roadside, he asked him for the directions to ours. As it happened, he was on the edge of the parish, and when he found that out, he immediately knelt down to pray, and he famously stated to that boy, My young friend, you have shown me the way to ours. I shall show you the way to heaven. This mission is about getting to heaven and taking others with us. After years of toil, trial, and many tribulations, dreaming of the Trappists and the Carthusians, Jean-Marie Vianney decided to leave his parish to seek a monastic vocation in order to save his soul. You ever felt like that? You're not saving your soul and you want to run away and hide in the woods, be a hermit? He wanted to weep for his sins and prepare for a holy death. He tried to get away three times. One time he left around midnight to begin his journey to embrace the life of solitude, prayer, and penance. Only to stop by a wayside cross, thinking to himself, Is it really the will of God what I am now doing? Is not the conversion of even one soul of greater value than all the prayers that I might say in solitude? He then retraced his steps to find many souls waiting for him at the parish church. The good God would not let him escape from his place. The good God was showing the curé the way to heaven. He was showing him how to be angelic. In 1858, Lourdes, France, after the town officials had, without success, tried to scare St. Bernadette from returning to the grotto. As she promised Our Lady she would for 15 days in a row, the fright intended for Bernadette landed on the parents. Out of fear, they forbade her to return to that grotto anymore. Obeying her parents, she did not go back next day until she was stopped by what she called a beam of air, like this invisible beam in the air. She couldn't get through it. It blocked her path to the school. Suddenly, the little virgin found her feet turning toward the grotto by an angel. And responding to a divine impulse, she flew to the cave of Masabiel, faster than the guards could keep up with her. The policemen 
For his part, God had already accepted the 15-day contract agreed to earlier by Bernadette and her parents. And so he would not let this little virgin fail to keep her part. He was showing Bernadette and her parents the way to heaven, the way to be angelic and not give way to fear. And she, for her part, opened the way for many others to follow. How many thousands, even millions, have been healed and saved through Lourdes? Thank you, St. Bernadette. When that Talbot could no longer resist the temptation to take a drink, he entered a tavern. By taking the oath of sobriety, he had made a contract with God to stop drinking. God remained firm in his acceptance of this oath and prevented Matt from being noticed or served anything by those attending the bar. Coming to himself, Matt left the tavern without having taken a drink and made his way to drink of the graces flowing from the tabernacle. The way to heaven opened up to him. He became angelic in his determination. Matt never drank alcohol again. At Fatima, 1917, the children agreed to come to the Cova di Iria every 13th of the month for six months, from May to October. Although they did not show up on the fourth month, that's August 13th, because they were under arrest, illegally, Our Lady came anyway. She came to that oak. She came out of the sky. People saw the cloud. They saw the changes in the atmosphere. Our Lady kept her contract. She knew they weren't there. She was showing, we keep our contracts. The Blessed Virgin came again in a different place. A few days later, on the 19th of the same month, declaring to the children, I want you to come, I want you to continue to come to the Cova di Iria on the 13th and to continue to say the rosary every day. In other words, keep to your agreement. Keep to the agreement we talked about. Lucia then asked the most beautiful lady if she would be willing to perform a miracle so that all might see and believe. She responded, yes, in the last month, in October, I shall perform a miracle so that all may believe in my apparitions. And then she adds these amazing words. If they had not taken you to the village, the miracle would have been greater. If you had not broken your contract, it would have been better. Wow. God keeps his contracts and fulfilling them leads to wonderful realities, miracles, salvation of souls, heavenly joys. At the same time, any diminution of the good things flowing from them comes from human failures or man's unwillingness to cooperate with God. As King David says in the Psalms, The Lord keepeth all them that love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. Once again, we heard in the Gospel, What man of you that hath a hundred sheep, and if he shall lose one of them, doth he not leave the ninety-nine in the desert and go after that which was lost until he find it? Let's face facts. Come on. Few of us, if any, would leave the 99 in the desert to rescue one lost sheep. We would cut our losses and maintain what we have. As for that lost sheep, that's his problem. He should have known better. He's getting what he deserves wherever he is. Does that not just about cover the normal human sentiment and feeling about such things. Yet when God enters into an agreement, a contract, it is unto the end. 
God does not change. As we just heard, saints like Jean-Marie Vianney, Bernadette, and Matt Talbot, they learned how important that really is. Keeping his part of the agreement saved them. And through them, God saved many others. This unflinching firmness of God in keeping his side of an agreement with his creatures is on display in his angels. When the angels choose something, they are fixed in that choice. They do not change their minds, as we mentioned earlier, nor can they. It's done. They're pure spiritual beings. And when they make a decision, it's a done thing. It's fixed. It's over. Angels are not wishy-washy like us. This is why devils cannot repent in order to leave hell. This is also why the good angels can never sin. But for us, this means that when one of them has agreed to be our guardian angel, they agree to this with their whole being. That's awesome. They will it to the end, no matter what happens. They seek our salvation, come what may. They love us unto the end. If a man refuses to be saved, they still try hard to lessen the evil that that man may be set about committing. Oh, how good are the angels in dealing with us poor, wretched sinners. Do we appreciate them? Again, the fathers of the church teach us the 99 sheep mentioned by our Lord, that is, the ones left behind in the desert. They symbolize the angels left behind in heaven because they can be left behind, because they will to the end. and They won't give up. I can trust that they're going to continue to serve me while I go after that lost sheep. While the Son of God, the Good Shepherd, descends to the earth to save the fallen race of Adam, the one lost sheep. As we learned earlier, this makes sense since the number 99 indicates the great variety of angels making up nine choirs in all. Purely spiritual beings, each angel is a species unto itself. Whereas we humans are one single species. Thus, the reason the parable mentions the 99 is compared to the one lost sheep. Now we capture something of this in the Angelus. That prayer that is named after St. Gabriel, the archangel. We pray morning, noon, and evening. Now in which we ring bells, how many times at the beginning? Nine. And then in the second part, we ring the bells nine times again. Nine, nine. The Angelus. Blessed Francis Palau, the 19th century Carmelite mystic, he echoes the teaching of St. Thomas Aquinas on the incomprehensible number of angels. These are his words to get your mind adjusted to just how many angels there really are. He says... God has created intellects which are purely spiritual, much more sublime than man. These are the angels whose number exceed the grains of the sand on the seashores to the stars of heaven and all the galaxies and all the stars and the leaves of the trees and of grasses that have existed, exist and will exist on the earth. That's incomprehensible. What is more, each angel reflects some unique splendor of God. Making the spiritual world much richer in variety than the material world. Each angel is its own species. Each has its own unique splendor that is reflecting from God. What does this say? How wonderful must be the Lord our God. How wonderful he is. How beautiful. How incomprehensible. Infinite in loveliness and beauty. 
The holy angels above are also saints, enjoying the vision of God in heaven. They possess sin because they chose him from the beginning and would not change their minds. Like man, they started in a state of grace and were given a test fitting to them. Those passing the test were given the light of glory, lumen gloriae in the Latin, a gift of God required to see him face to face in heaven, the gift of glory. Those that failed the test, however, they lost all grace and were immediately damned and sent to dwell in hell, in the center of the earth, the sewer of the universe. Being angelic, they can never change their minds. It is forever. Now, God wants us to be like the heavenly angels. He wants to be angelic. This is why the church encourages us to make decisions as if we were angels. She wants us to fix our minds on our end as if we were already there. She wants us to have an angelic spirituality. Why? Because once our bodies die and our souls leave them, as we mentioned earlier, the choice we have made with them is forever fixed. There's no changing it. We become like the angels, or sad to say, as we mentioned before, like the demons, unable to change our eternal destination. This means God entered into a contract, a compact with us at our baptism. Like the angels in the beginning, Adam and Eve were created in a state of grace. Originally, man was body and soul with the Spirit of God dwelling in him. That's how we were originally created. In a word, in God's plan, man is incomplete without grace. This is why sinful man is restless until he rests in the Lord. This is why sinful fallen man roams the earth, as it were, like the devils, ever seeking something to fill up what is lacking in his soul. He's restless. And this is why science is stunted without theology. This is why society is flat without the church. In Adam, we lost verticality. The church, therefore, desiring us to become angelic in our willing of God and accepting his ways, has us make vows at the beginning of our journey so that we will remain faithful unto the end, until death. Once again, these vows are first and foremost the vows of baptism, which we will renew in this mission later on. In these vows, we promise to remain firm in rejecting the world, the flesh, and the devil, while professing the one true faith and hope and charity. And again, some are encouraged to add on to these vows a sort of second baptism, the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, the vows of religion. Or, if they're not called to that, then the vows of holy marriage, holy matrimony. In any case, all of them are dedicated to keeping us on the right path. These vows are supposed to be angelically willed unto the end, until death. Now this baptismal contract, instituted by the Good Shepherd to rescue the lost sheep of Adam, even unto the end of the world, enables us to enter once again into a loving friendship with God. Thus, this contract is precious beyond all telling. It's a ticket to eternal life. It is habitual grace infused into the soul. A foretaste and seed of heaven, the first step toward becoming like our friends, the angels. Without it, we're no better than the beasts. The world is proving it to us daily. Man is becoming more and more bestial as days pass. Fewer and fewer are baptized. With baptism, we start to become truly human as God created us in Adam. Thanks to baptism, we can make the next step to becoming angelic forever. That is, we can receive the light of glory. 
Lumen Gloriae. Upon death. Enabling us to see and possess God forever. Oh, how important it is to be in a state of grace and to persevere to the end. O oh Lord, grant us this gift, the light of glory, that we may see you face to face forever in heaven. Now, how do we know we're in a state of grace? Perhaps we've lost this precious gift. Few value it, and they lose it like nothing and think nothing of it. Sad to say. Sometimes when passing through a dark trial, we can begin to wonder if we're still friends of God. During her most unjust trial, St. Joan of Arc was asked if she was in a state of grace. And she responded as few in the history of the church have. She responded wonderfully, stupendously. She said, if I am, may God so keep me. If I am not, may God so place me. I would rather die than not be in the love of God. Joan of Arc. Everyone present knew this to be a most tricky question. No one can look inside their souls to see if they're in a state of grace. We cannot have intellectual certainty that we are in a state of grace as we have in matters of mathematics. So intellectual certainty is like 2 plus 2 is 4. Intellectual certainty in science is things like we know the laws of gravity. I drop this, it's heavy, it'll fall. Nor can we have certainty afforded us by faith, which is the greatest of all certainty possessed on earth because the authority of the one revealing is God himself. Although we have certainty of faith that God exists, made the universe, was born of the Virgin Mary, and so on, that he's three persons and one God. We do not have that same conviction as to whether or not we are in a state of grace. We can, however, have what is called moral certainty. Moral certainty, which is the sureness of the will and can only be approached indirectly. St. Paul expressed this in so many words when he spoke to the Corinthians. I am not conscious to myself of anything sinful, yet I am not hereby justified. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. St. John mentions it in his first letter. Dearly beloved, if our heart do not reprehend us, we have confidence toward God. If our heart do not reprehend us, the heart is the home of the will. Thus, the reason for calling it moral certainty, the word moral refers to the will and its choices. Thus, morality has to do with making choices and has to do with human behavior. That is, whether something is virtuous or sinful. So, a man has moral certainty that he is in a state of grace when he is not aware of having committed any mortal sin since his last confession or since his baptism. As St. Paul says, that does not immediately mean that such a person is sinless, but as soon as they become aware of sin, they confess it. And they get moral certainty again. Thus, St. Joan of Arc and St. Catherine of Siena and those like them often went to confession even every day. So moral certainty is having a clear conscience. It's not just having a feeling we're okay. It's having a clear conscience. It's understanding this principle is important for maintaining peace of soul in troubled times, obviously. Think about it. Okay, sin is in the will. Sin is not in the intellect, nor is it in the passions, or lower appetites, that is, even though they may participate in sinning, and often do. We may recognize the unruliness of our thoughts, or the passions clamoring to be satisfied. But we only begin to sin when we start giving in to these clamorings in the heart. We 
make the heart a part of it by consenting to those clamorings. Thus, it is only when such unruly, disordered things get connected up to the will that sin begins in the soul. The more connected, the more sinful. Now recall from our catechism that mortal sin requires full consent of the will. Affirm, yes, I want this. Yes, I will do this. A sign that full consent has been given is how the sinner, he rests in the sin and takes delight in it. He says to himself, ah, finally, I get what I want. This is happiness for me. And then he seeks to indulge in the thing as much as possible. He wallows in it like a Sow in a mire. When St. Therese of the Child Jesus and the Holy Face grasped these basics of morality, she overflowed with joy because she could not remember ever willfully sinning in her entire life. She had moral certainty that she had retained her baptismal innocence. Of no little importance here, we can also see the need of keeping our conscience properly informed. As a part of this mission, we provide a detailed examination of conscience and often encourage people to make at least one general confession in their life. That's where you confess all the sins you can think of. All the sins they can remember for their most tender years. Is this not the same reason why many people would flock to confessors like John marie Vianney and St. Padre Pio? to make sure their souls were cleansed and that they were truly in a state of grace. They wanted to possess moral certainty that they were friends and children of God. It should be obvious that moral certainty plays an essential role in overcoming various trials like scruples, sinful thoughts, and rebellious passions. And whether or not to receive Holy Communion... How do we know when we have sinned or done evil and departed from the Lord's commandments? Our conscience informs us. When this happens in matters of gravity, we no longer have moral certitude that we are in a state of grace, that we're friends of God. Moral certainty then can greatly help us in keeping our peace of soul in times of trial. That's what the confession is so beautiful because it restores moral certainty when it is in doubt. Keeps you at peace. Recall the holy man Job. He provides an excellent scriptural example of moral certainty in action. As the scriptures say, he was innocent and good. He even sought to make amends for the sins of his children by having sacrifices offered for them regularly. Yet for many reasons, one of which was to give posterity an example so that we could actually talk about Job today. God allowed the devil to attack dear Job and do grave harm to his goods, his family, and his very body. Job's friends arrived to convince him that he was a sinner and that his sin, his sin was truly the cause of all his troubles. All he need do is confess. But there was a problem. Job could not come up with any sins. His conscience was clear. He stated clearly, For my heart doth not reprehend me in all my life. He had moral certitude that he was still friends with God and therefore he longed to speak to God about all the evil that had fallen upon him and his family to understand why. His moral certitude gave him great confidence to approach God. Like St. Paul, however, he openly admits that he is not by that account sinless. Thus he asked and he pleaded with God, How many are my iniquities and sins? Make me know my crimes and offenses. What have I done? The friends of Job, whom he called troublesome, 
comforters end up adding sin upon sin by falling into rash judgment, attacking Job, claiming without doubt that Job was with sin. And they tried and tried to get him to admit it, a sort of forced confession. Come on, admit it, admit it. Say, uncle, stop judging and you will not be judged, says the Lord. And we know that the Lord did judge these troublesome comforters at the end of the book, and he found them wanting and to be in sin and to be not friends of his any longer. Whereas Job remained without sin in all he did and said, Thus God said to the leader of Job's friends, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, because you have not spoken the thing that is right before me, as my servant Job hath. As a result, Job had to pray and do penance for them. But the lesson is this. It was moral certitude of being in a state of grace that provided Job with what he needed to weather his difficult trial. You see that? What gave Job the strength to endure all that? Moral certitude. Moral certitude. That whole book is a book about moral certainty. Now, this moral certainty of having sanctifying grace in our souls is needed if we are to be numbered among the 99 who remain in the desert. If we're to remain to the end, we have to have moral certainty that we're in a state of grace. We must cherish and maintain this gift of God, this divine indwelling, a share in the divine life. What is more, we must strive to maintain the gift of God unto the end, without fail, firmly willing as the angels did never to lose it, never to break our contract or vows of baptism. Thus Job stated, my justification, which I have begun to hold, I will not forsake. This is practicing for heaven. This is participating in the angelic spirituality that saves. And so many of the great saints were called seraphic. The seraphic Teresa. The seraphic Francis. Why? By keeping their vows, they had climbed up through the choirs of angels to the very top. All this changes, however, by committing one mortal sin. Mortal sin is simply embracing something in our hearts, in our wills, that we know is gravely wrong in our minds. We know it's wrong, but we do it anyway. It is a division between head and heart, a violation of our conscience. If the matter is grave, then it's mortal. Otherwise, it's venial. Grace is totally lost when mortal is diminished when venial. Those who commit mortal sins for the first time after being baptized or in a state of grace for a while, they often are given a warning. They feel a strange lightheadedness, a kind of pinging feeling inside as God prepares to exit the soul, allowing the sinner to do his own thing, allowing him to fall under a new father, the devil. May we never forget committing sin, especially mortal sin, but even voluntary venial sin is practicing for hell. It is a diabolical rebellion, living for the moment and not for the end of heaven. Not for that light of glory that is given to the angels. Now this brings up to us what the 99 are supposed to be doing here in the desert while the Lord, the Good Shepherd, goes out to seek the lost sheep. People get bored and they start sinning. They get depressed. The fact that you are awake and aware at this moment in history, the fact that you are present at this mission shows that you are called to be numbered among the 99. What is more, it shows that you are in the test itself. This is it, folks. 
This is the same test the good angels had to pass through. All the saints before us endured. You're in the place of Job. To receive the same light of glory possessed by the angels and the saints, that gift of God that is necessary to see and possess him forever in heaven, we must remain firmly committed unto the end, living always in a state of grace. Death before sin. That should be our motto. Listen to the Carmelite Blessed Elizabeth of the Trinity. Talk to the Good Shepherd about striving to be one of the 99 sheep that is left behind. She's willing to be left behind. Listen to her words. I accept in advance every sacrifice, every trial, even that of no longer feeling thee in me. I only ask one thing. To always be generous and faithful. Always. I never want to take it back. I want to do thy will perfectly, to respond always to thy grace. Blessed Elizabeth. But just as the good angels are specially deputed to combat the bad angels, that is, those who would not keep to their place, so too the 99 must not just sit back and bemoan their situation, but also work to save souls. That's our job. When Job was left in the desert, he did complain. He complained a little, and he got in trouble for it. Thus, we hear him say, when God finally spoke to him, he said, what can I answer? I who have spoken inconsiderately, I will lay my hand upon my mouth. St. Gregory the Great says of this passage in Job, if we discuss all Job's words, we shall find nothing impiously spoken, as may be gathered from the Lord himself. But what was reprehensible in him was the manner of expressing himself at times, speaking too much of his own affliction and too little of God's goodness toward him, behavior which here he acknowledges as inconsiderate. There it is. He was speaking too much of his own affliction. How often do we complain about our own afflictions, forgetting the goodness of God toward us? How often do we bemoan not feeling God's presence in our souls or seeing him work in the world around us, in our families, our parish, our diocese, our city, our country, or even the church as a whole? We bemoan, where is God? Job, however, goes on to show us what the 99 are called to do to pass through the present trials. This is very important. Once again, Job goes to show us what the 99 are called to do to pass through the present trials. When his friends were convicted of sin by God, the scriptures indicate that Job was greatly blessed only after he prayed and did penance for them. Interesting. Here's the exact phrase. The Lord also was turned at the penance of Job when he prayed for his friends. And then the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. There's some very important lessons here. Let's spend the rest of our time looking into them. First, we can note how easy it would have been for Job to hate those mean-spirited friends those troublesome comforters who it seems tortured him more than all his other misfortunes combined. I hate you. Get away from me. You've done nothing but torture me. But he did not despise them. Remember how the angels choose and will something all the way to the end? Job, as one of the 99, had already willed to be friends with these men, come what may. Because of his angelic choice, these men were saved. They were not abandoned by God because of Job. It seems this element of the angelic spirituality is captured in the Russian parable, the parable of the onion, found in the book of the brothers Karamazov. It's about a guardian angel. The parable of the onion. It goes like this. Once upon a time, there was a woman. She was as wicked as wicked could be. And she died. 
and not one good deed was left behind her. The devils took her and threw her into the lake of fire. And her guardian angel stood thinking, What good deed of hers can I remember to tell God? Then he remembered and said to God, Once she pulled up an onion and gave it to a beggar woman. And God answered, Now take that same onion, hold it out to her in the lake. Let her take hold of it and pull. If you can pull her out of the lake, she can go to paradise. But if the onion breaks, she has to stay where she is. The angel ran to the woman and held out the onion to her. Here, woman, he said, take hold of it and I'll pull. And he began pulling carefully and had almost pulled her all the way out when other sinners in the lake saw her being pulled out and all began holding on to her so as to be pulled out with her. But the woman was wicked as wicked could be and she began to kick those sinners with her feet. It's me who's getting pulled out, not you. It's my onion, not yours. No sooner did she say it than the onion broke and the woman fell back into the lake and is burning there to this day. The angel wept and went away. The wicked woman failed because she could only think of herself. Whereas her angel could only think of God and this poor woman. The angel did not hate the wicked woman, but willed to save her unto the end. In a similar way, Job, acting as one of the 99, saved his friends despite their bad behavior. And so do our angels act toward us. And so are we to act toward our fellow man. In order to do this ourselves without falling into anger or despair, we need a sense of humor. I know it's hard. That's why I'm giving you this, these tools. We need a sense of humor. We say a person has a sense of humor if he can see through things. God made the world with a sense of humor inasmuch as we are able to see him through his creation, to see his power in the mountains, we say, his infinity in the stars of heaven, his mercy in the ocean, his beauty in the sunsets, his personality in a snowflake, because every single snowflake is unique and unrepeatable. His love in the human heart and his humility in the incarnation that the Son of God would become man and deign to be wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. With a sense of humor, we can see God's presence around us and in us and in other people. We can see His image. The saints have always had this sense of humor. Most notably, they were always able to find God in any part of His creation, causing them to be filled with wonder. In their own lives, they could see a resurrection through the trials and the sorrows of life. And others, they could easily see through people and all their silly posturing, defenses and scheming. They saw the saint behind the sinner and they loved him and saved him. As we have noted, some like St. Jean-Marie Vianney and St. Padre Pio had such depth perception, they could gaze into the very core of the souls that came to them. As a result, the saints kept their peace of soul while helping others find their way. And they even smiled and rejoiced when undergoing the various difficult trials this life has to offer, knowing it was only temporary. They did not get blocked or sidetracked by present failures or the sins, hatred, and malice of others. Man loses his sense of humor in at least two ways. First of all, he loses it by way of sin. Sin makes man selfish, as we saw with the woman and her onion. Because of sin, man begins to take money too seriously. Ever met anybody happy that has a lot of money? You wonder. The flesh they take too seriously. Business too seriously. Food too seriously. 
By doing so, man makes these things have no other purpose than to satisfy him and serve his immediate needs. When he loses his sense of humor, he stops seeing God in things and at the end of things. He stops seeing why the laws God established are according to how God created the world. Sinful man starts to see God's laws merely as rules forced upon him from the outside instead of coming from the inside, from the natural law. All this makes him feel burdened, sad, depressed, and angry. That describes the world we're living in now. Man also loses his sense of humor, not only from sin, but when he becomes over-idealistic. He is perpetually sad, bitter, and even violent that things are just not the way they're supposed to be. In his mind, he lives a sort of platonic dream world of ideal forms, always looking for the ideal spouse, the ideal family, the ideal priest, parish, church, country, or world. Oh, how the devil loves these idealists. He can get them to do many things for him with the zeal of what seems to be a clear conscience. Very dangerous. The man with a godly sense of humor, however, is not moved to hate others, either because their sins or their lack of fulfilling a desired goal. A desired ideal. Many are sinning gravely now. They're hurting us. They're dividing our families, our parishes, our country. The world and even the Holy Catholic Church herself deeply divided now, more than ever. We must not hate them. How easy it is to hate them. The king has left, yes. He's left to gain a kingdom. The good shepherd is away seeking the lost sheep. Things are falling apart. The situation is less than ideal. Oh yes, very much so. To remain firm in the desert, the 99 need to keep a sense of humor. Practice seeing God through things and in things. Now the second major lesson is this. Job shows us the 99 are to supply what is needed for the shepherd to save souls. We find that the saintly angelic helpers left behind in the desert know what they are about and are willing to stay even to the end of the world to save a single soul. Listen to St. Jean-Marie Vianney one more time express this for all the saints. He speaks for them all. He said, if I already had my foot in heaven and were told to return to earth to work for the conversion of one sinner, I would gladly return. And if to obtain that end it were necessary for me to remain here till the world's last day, to get up at midnight and to suffer all that I suffer now, averaging along the lines of 15 hours in the confessional a day, I would agree to it with all my heart. Wow. That is angelic spirituality. With all my heart, to the last day of the world, for one soul, 15 hours a day in the confessional. St. Therese of Jesus, she says the same of the Lutherans causing much unrest in France. She says... I wept before our Lord and begged him to remedy the condition of affairs in France. I would have given my life a thousand times over to save a single one of the souls that were being lost there. This is angelic spirituality. Perhaps you're saying, I'm not such a man, Father. I can't do it. I'm nothing. What can I do? Blessed Francis Palau felt the very same, and he complained to the church, appearing to him in a mystical vision, this beautiful bride, virginal bride. He said, miserable me, what use am I for this mission? I can hardly save myself from the power of the demons, and how will I save the peoples and nations possessed by him? 
The church then responded to him. Understand this mystery. Just as a captain saves himself by saving his people, so you, by saving others, will save yourself. And if you do not save others, you will not save yourself. Come, she said, to arms. Let's go to battle. By saving others, you will save yourself. And if you do not save others, you will not save yourself. Our lady said to the children, the shepherd children, Fatima, pray, pray a great deal and make sacrifices for sinners. For many souls go to hell for not having someone to pray and make sacrifices for them. Did we not hear St. Jude and St. James tell us at the beginning of this conference to strive to save souls with all our hearts? Let us never forget that a single human soul is more precious to God than the whole created order. This needs to be repeated over and over and over again today because of the confusion in the church. A single human soul is more precious than all the galaxies of stars. The panorama of plants and animals on the earth and in the sky, on the land and the sea. One human soul is more dear to God than all these combined. For he did not become man to save them, to save the environment, which will burn on the last day. Be assured of that. It will burn. All of it. But he did pour out his precious blood on the cross to save our souls, human souls. Once again, St. Teresa of Jesus comes to our aid and says of love and souls, in the case of perfect love, if a person loves, there is the passion to make the other soul worthy of being loved. This person does everything he can for the other's benefit. He would lose a thousand lives that a little good might come to the other soul. Perfect love wants to save souls. This is the perfect love of Christ. This is the love our guardian angels have for us. This is angelic spirituality. Souls are not cheap. They're not easily saved. There's always a struggle for them, even a struggle unto death, as we see in every crucifix. Human souls are stubborn things. You know that by now. But this is why they're so precious. They cost much to claim and make over to be pure, good, and godly. And oh, how beautiful is the soul of a saint. It is a universe in itself, a microcosmos of the whole created order, and a wonderful reflection of God himself. Harmony and truth and goodness and right are found therein. It's a treasure, St. Catherine of Siena says, when the soul arrives at eternal life, all participate in the good of that soul, and that soul in their good. In a mysterious mutual indwelling and enrichment such that they are refreshed by what, by what they find in each other. Wow, what will heaven be like? Examples of this truth are not hard to find in the lives of the saints. Abraham interceded before God, seeking that even Sodom and Gomorrah, he knew what they were, he knew what they were about. He interceded with God and begged and pleaded that they might be spared if only ten just men might be found there. Moses did not hate or attack Miriam and Aaron and the numerous others of Israel for rising up against him in the desert for rebelling against him, but instead interceded for them in order to save them from the wrath of God. From the life of Venerable Mother Mary of Algrida, we hear how one day, as she prayed behind the cloister grating, two workmen approached the sacristan and asked for and received permission to set a large chest just inside the church door indicating only that it contained merchandise for safekeeping. Deep in meditative prayer, Sor Maria heard sad moans and profound lamentations. 
In a later report, this consecrated religious indicated that she had been frightened and disturbed because the moans and sighs sounded horrible and seemed hopeless. She realized the sighs emanated from the box left by the workmen. As it happened, this box was actually a coffin harboring an anguished soul. One that had died in a state of unrepentant, unrepented mortal sin. To the mystic, there could be no worse fate. She prayed that God would put new life into the soul so that it would, could repent before facing judgment. In struggling for more understanding, the venerable mother soon realized that the body within the coffin was none other than her own dear brother, Father Francesco Coronel. He had at one time held a position of authority at a Franciscan college in Madrid. But in later years, he had felt his efforts were not sufficiently rewarded and had returned to Agrida, discontented, ambitions thwarted, bitter toward God and the church. Sor Maria grieved for her brother. She called upon God's infinite mercy to concede new life to him for a brief time and space so he could confess his sins. In response, she felt prompted to arrange for a priest to hear her brother's confession. A neighboring priest responded to the request and later reported that he was frightened to death at the prospect of attending to a dead person. Would you please come and hear the confession of this dead man? Her priestly brother then stepped out of his coffin alive and prostrated himself in a cruciform shape before the altar. After some time, he came to his feet to the feet of the confessor and made a painful confession. Another witness who had left during the confession returned and saw Father Coronel re-enter his coffin, arms raised toward the cloister, choir, platform in gratitude to his sister. Then he reclined and passed away in peace. The lid of the casket was closed and the same two workmen returned to the church and carried away the coffin to be buried. She remained behind as one of the 99. Around the turn of the 20th century, Father Germanus, the spiritual father of St. Gemma Galgani, he witnessed the following exchange reminiscent of Abraham's angelic pleading before God on the mountain. One evening, feeling an ecstasy coming on, St. Gemma got up from the supper table and went to her room. The subject of the ecstasy was the conversion of a sinner, and the form was a wrestling match between the blessed maiden and the divine justice to obtain this conversion. I confess, he said, that I have never beheld anything more affecting. This dear child, with her eyes, face, and all her person turned toward a part of the room where our Lord appeared to her. She was not agitated, but earnest and resolute, like one in a struggle who is determined to win at any cost. She began by saying, As you have come, Jesus, I renew my supplications for my sinner. He's your child and my brother. Save him, Jesus. And she named him. She named him. He was a stranger whom she had met in Luca, and moved by spiritual impulse, she had already warned him very often by word of mouth and by letter to listen to the dictates of his conscience and not be contented with mere public reputation of being a good Christian. You're in a state of sin. Go to confession. That's what she told him. His majesty, seeming disposed to deal as a just judge, with this man, remained unmoved. By the entreaties of his servant, he would not be moved. But she, no wise deterred, rejoined, Why today, O Jesus, do you not heed me? You have shed your blood for him as well as for me. Will you save me and not him? I will not rise from here. Save him. Promise me that you will save him. I offer myself victim for all, but particularly for this man. I promise not to refuse you anything. Do you grant it to me? 
It is a soul. Remember, O Jesus, it is a soul that cost you so much. He will become good and not relapse. And then our Lord mentioned to her all his sins and relapses one by one with the most minute circumstances of time and place, the evil deeds of that sinner, adding that he had filled up their measure. It seemed he must be abandoned to his own devices. The poor child showed her dismay. She let her hands fall and heaved a deep sigh, as if she had almost lost hope of succeeding, but quickly recovering from the shock, she returned to the attack. I know, Jesus, she said, I know it, that he has offended you thus grievously. But I have done worse. And for all that, you have shown me mercy. I know, I know, O oh Jesus, that he has made you weep. Remember that I want his salvation. Triumph, triumph, I ask him of thee in charity. In spite of all these efforts, the reward remained inflexible, and Gemma again relapsed into anguish and discouragement, remaining silent, as if she had abandoned the strife. Then, all of a sudden, with another motive flashed to her mind that seemed invincible against all resistance, she became all animated and spoke thus, Well, I am a sinner. You yourself have told me that worse than me you could not find... Yes, I confess that I am unworthy that you should listen to me. But look, I present you another advocate for my sinner. It is your own mother who asks you to forgive him. Oh, imagine saying no to your mother. Surely you cannot say no to her. And now answer me, Jesus. Say that you have saved my sinner. The victory was gained. The whole scene changed aspect. The tender-hearted Savior had granted the grace, and Gemma, with a look of indescribable joy, exclaimed, He is saved! He is saved! You have conquered Jesus! Triumph thus always! And then she came out of the ecstasy. Now, Father Germanus tells us the rest of the story. How shortly after this strange man asked to see him, he said, I bade him come in. He threw himself at my feet, sobbing, and said, Father, hear my confession. I thought my heart would burst. It was Gemma's sinner, converted that same hour. He accused himself of all that I had heard repeated by her in the ecstasy. He had forgotten only one thing, and I was able to remind him of it. I consoled him, told him what had just happened, got his leave to narrate these wonders of the Lord, and after a mutual embrace, we parted. Here is what we have learned this conference about the 99 left behind and their angelic spirituality, such that we will construct an ark, as it were, to carry us safely through these flooding revolutionary times in which we live. First of all, after the fall of Adam, God mercifully provides a way back into friendship with him through baptism. With this precious gift, we receive the indwelling of God, habitual grace. This is a pledge of future glory. It is a ticket to heaven. It's the beginning of heaven. It makes us one of the 99. Second, with baptism, we enter into a compact with God, taking vows to remain firm unto the end. With baptism, we're numbered among the 99 in the desert who are to exercise an angelic spirituality characterized by determination and the will. Death before sin. Third, Moral certainty helps us know whether we're in a state of grace or not. If we're not, we run to confession. If we are, we keep going to confession regularly to prevent ourselves from falling away. Be sure to get an examination of conscience to inform your conscience and keep it enlightened. Four, those that do fall away become lost sheep. 
And it is only by way of the 99 that they are brought back. Thus the 99 do not hate those that have fallen away, but see through them, exercising a sense of humor to see their souls free from the grip of sin and the devil, seeing the saint behind the sinner. Listen to St. John Climacus. He says, Let us refrain from passing judgments or condemnation on our neighbor. If we do avoid passing judgment on persons, then we will not be terrorized by blasphemous thoughts, since the one produces the other. Let us always be about saving souls for God. That's what we learned tonight. And finally, we must plead with God and His holy angels to make us keep our side of the agreement as He did so often and so wonderfully with His saints. Thank you for listening.